Today is uh, part four of the Don't Give Up, Hope Wins, Love Wins. How to find hope in a time of great pain and suffering. Um, I think the last number of weeks um, have kind of revealed um, some underlying stresses that many people have, including myself. Um, I know we began the pandemic talking about how to cast our fears away and trust Jesus and have our eyes focused and all that stuff. And it was good, but it gets wearisome. Like after this long, it's really hard to, um, um, it's hard to remember the basics because we're being bombarded with messaging from, um, our family members because family dynamics change when you're stuck in a house. Now I'm not saying this is, I'm not pointing to my house. I'm just saying I, I have heard this. Um, in fact, when I, let's say I'm home for holidays during the summer um, and I'm home for like two or three weeks, the dynamics change because now I'm there I'm, and it changes the environment. So when you have everyone stuck at home, it changes the environment. Um, problems not dealt with <laughs> rise to the surface and you got to deal with them and they can either go bad or it can go good. Uh, it can reveal and has revealed, honestly, I think this pandemic has revealed um, cracks in our relationships, cracks in our theology, cracks in our patterns of life that uh, we've just filled in with a, a cheap putty or a, a really cheap silicone just to make it through to the next stress. But all the stress fractures are now showing and uh, it's revealing some uh, what I would say um, patterns that are unhealthy for us to continue in and they need to be purged uh, burned out with a holy fire so to speak <laughs> you got to go listen to the to the uh, uh, Wednesday morning <laughs> talk on what is hell it's great um, but it's a uh, honestly this is this is a, a really big deal and that's why I think uh, this particular series of don't give up uh, is because I'm hearing some folks flippantly say and some of that are watching here uh, I've said it quietly under my breath but we just flippantly say I'm done with this I am done with the pandemic this is so stupid and and all these phrases and there's there's freedom among friends to do that but when it's your go-to phrase to people you don't even know very well, um, it, it, it invites argument. It invites built up frustration. You might pop somebody else's balloon with your prickly comment. They're just holding together, trying not to pop and your comments or comments or attitude can poke and create an anxiety that is very hurtful. And this is not the way we've been created to function. And so I want to find out how can we look for hope in a time like this? I know there's some hope of of the layers of pandemic restrictions being lifted and that's all great i'm not i'm not talking about the legitimacy of those i'm not talking about any of that i'm talking about our individual responses in light of being in christ this is the only place i can go there's too many opinions out there for all the other stuff i don't even want to get into it um I, i've had some good conversations with good friends where we can actually talk about some topics regarding the pandemic and politics and all that stuff knowing we're friends we can banter back and forth safely if you don't have that then don't create those conversations with people that aren't safe yet or you're assuming much don't don't do that it's just it tears down trust and i want to see us rebuild trust because we are going to be getting together again it's going to look different we're going to get together differently um uh, some people will have stopped going to church altogether some will have switched churches some are going to say wait a minute the church lied to me it's actually fun staying home on a sunday morning <laughs> like th those kinds of things are running through everyone's head so what's this going to look like? I don't know. Um, all I know for me, I want to encourage and inspire hope. That's it. That, that's all I can do. I, I can't fix problems that people have. I'm trying to fix my own. Thanks. Um, but at least if we can together as a church family, as believers or as seekers or as uh, disciples of Christ, that's a good way to put it. That's a pretty basic. Let us grow together. And let's encourage one another. Let's inspire one another. I want to read this uh, uh, next uh, um, short, it's like a short devotional from Henry Nouwen. I've got two today that I want to read. 
Um, uh, one is from uh, Mo Thomas, and I, I saw a number of folks post that. And uh, when I read it, I realized, hmm, and I'll, I'll explain why I put, I'm um, sharing that one later, but let's talk about this, the divine choice of weakness. Now, here's what inspired me about this one. This, this fits perfectly with this whole idea. Remember last week we talked about being still and what that means and seeing in scripture how it says, be still, be still, be still. Um, this is part of that journey. Why do we, why do we need to be still to bring us to this place? What I'm going to share right now, this, this is the goal. This is the map, the roadmap to why being still matters. Listen to this. God chose to enter into human history in complete weakness. That divine choice forms the center of the Christian faith. In Jesus of Nazareth, the powerless God appeared among us to unmask the illusion of power, to disarm the prince of darkness who rules the world, and to bring the divided human race to a new unity. Ooh. It is through total and unmitigated powerlessness that God shows us divine mercy. It is very hard, if not impossible, for us to grasp this divine mercy. We keep praying to the almighty and powerful God, but all the might and power is absent from the one who reveals God to us, saying, when you see me, you see the Father. If we truly want to love God, we have to look at the man of Nazareth whose life was wrapped in weakness and his weakness opens for us the way to the heart of God. Ooh, this is, this is heavy. Like we always think, oh, I need the power of God to, to move mountains. I need the power of God to give me great faith. I, and we, we translate the power of God and try to mimic it. And worse, people try and take that power for their own direction, trying to become more powerful, more influential, when eek, it's the exact opposite with Jesus. This is a hard one. Our world is built on, you know, moving up the ladder, showing we have value to the world so that we feel we have value and we'll do everything we can, even if we're faking it. This is a powerful devotional. The way up is down. The way forward is inward. It really, this was, I thought this was really powerful. All right, let's dig in. We talked about being still. I want to. Uh, I came across a couple of slides after last Sunday's message, and I want to share them with you as a follow-up from being still. I love this. Be still and know that I am God. The Hebrew word that is translated "be still" is Rapha. The word means to sink down, to relax, withdraw, idle, to drop, abandon, forsake, let go, refrain, let alone, to be quiet, to show oneself slack. So chill relax give yourself some slack and let go stop struggling cease striving be still abandon yourself to god and lighten up and know him <laughs> i thought that was that was really cool yeah and the next one's kind of cool too uh be still and know that i'm god this is a quick uh, snapshot if you if you want this just message me i'll, I'll paste you the picture but the idea of being still if we were to read the sentence slowly is talking about stop talking switch off your phone Stop commenting, listen, stop arguing, stop questioning, stop moaning. Um, oh, by the way, don't take that stop questioning the wrong way. This is, this, is, this is about being still, not being prepared with a list of questions to God. This is, that's what the kind of questioning that is, not questioning stuff. That's not the same thing. And no means stop doubting. That doesn't mean you can't doubt. This is talking about, this is the journey of stillness, okay? Be sure have faith, no second opinion, okay? And then lastly, that I am God, that God's almighty in control, and God is love. And even that word in control is a, a very interesting Western world conflict. We'll have to, I'm going to talk about that sometime. <laughs> There's a book written, God is Not in Control, that uh, is a great hook teaser to really in. It's a 
it, it, it's good. Um, God is king. He's my hope, my rock, my fortress, ever-present help in times of trouble. Uh, God is my father. He's my shepherd. He'll lead me, nourish me, protect me, and restore me. So these are concepts of being still. This is the follow-up from last week. Lastly, what does it look like? Walk in wisdom from Colossians 4. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be graciously seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, this, this is the whole sermon right here, if you wanted it to be. The, you may say, hey, maybe this is what God's trying to tell me today, that my words have not been... Um, wisely considered when I speak to family members or neighbors or people I'm mad at or frustrated with or uh, people that view this pandemic differently than me. My Maybe my words have been with, with a small pot shot, you know, just jab them because they're wrong and, and can't they see they're wrong. And those attitudes are not Christ. That's what this verse is saying. Walk in wisdom. You don't know what the other people are walking through or where they've come from. So this is all part of walking out our faith. This is all part of walking out what we say we believe. You say you believe in this God that lives in you. How much do you believe? Well, that's what I want to get into today. So here's here's this thing from Mo Thomas. When will it end? Now, um, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because somebody sent me a, a, a private message on Facebook. I have not responded yet. I had, just didn't have time. Uh, but the question is, you know, they were questioning why would God create us then to live through all this pain and suffering? You know, if, if, if we're all going to see Jesus one way or another. Um, assuming that, you know, everyone makes it to heaven, that kind of, that kind of mentality. And, and I thought, okay, there, we've been talking about, you know, Christ is in all, holds all things together. Uh, he's not going to abandon us. Do I have a hope for, for all to awaken to Christ? Yes, I do. Um, but the question would be, then why do we have to suffer like this? Why just can't we make a direct line to this eternal bliss? That's, it's a good question. And then this came up. By Mo Thomas. So Mo, if you're if you're watching um, or will watch later, this is this is I'm giving you credit here because this this was really smart. It it fit exactly a, a really wise response to this person's question, which I will copy and paste to her uh, later. Um, here it is. God, when will it end? By Mo Thomas. My friend and I were recently talking about the unbearable suffering and pain presently in our world, not just on TV but also in our own lives. Why? Why does it have to be this way? Perhaps it's in our imagination where the world's journey towards healing and wholeness can begin. <laughs> if the images in our mind and heart are mainly filled with pain, violence, and cruelty, our expression to the world will tend towards instinctive reaction. If these images instead are filled with Christ's vision of peace, harmony, and love, then our outward, ex outward expressions will be marked by healthy, life-giving, compassionate response. How to frame and shape these images? Silence, nature, contemplation, beauty, art and music, centering prayer or contemplative prayer, loving community, and Christ himself. How was Jesus, this is good, how was Jesus able to walk the shores of Galilee as the Romans tortured and crucified thousands upon thousands in utter mockery of human dignity? How was it possible to maintain joy and hope and relentless optimism for a better world? How did he avoid despair when human cruelty was dishing out all of its horrific worst all around him? This is the same God who sets up residence within us here, now, united, joined, and tangled with us forever, looking out through our eyes as we experience the world in all its breathtaking beauty and its raw, soul-crushing pain. Hear the Spirit whisper, Behold, I am making all things new. Well, starting with your inner portraits. And what do you mean by inner portraits? Your images. 
that you have ingrained either your images of who God, who you think God is and who you think you are. So how do we get through this? Great question. Some of you say, well, we're, we're, we're almost through it. No, we're not. Oh, no. We're not through anything. All we have is today. Don't forget that. Tomorrow, yes, we have hope. We, we need to, dreams are wonderful, okay? But we're not through this because this is revealing things in us that we need to deal with. And the more we reject the idea that we have to learn something from this, um, especially if you really do have to learn something, only you know that. This is not a broad stroke paintbrush for every single person, all right? But those that have been living on high stress or been kind of walking eggshells until a year and a half ago when eggshells suddenly changed to Lego and thumbtacks on the floor. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but we need to deal with some of these things. So how do, we, how do we get through this? Zechariah 4, 6 states it perfectly. And this is from uh, Kay Fairchild, a post that she posted. I love how this is worded. It is not by mental nor by, sorry, it is not by mental might nor by physical power, but by my consciousness, spirit or breath, says the Lord of hosts. So it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So to understand there's a lot going on here, it's not by your mental might. I, I, um, uh, I promise, I promise, I promise, or uh, here's my list. Today I'm going to do it, and you, and you just repeat the mantras you need to repeat to yourself to remind you whatever it takes. It's not by your mental might. It's not even by your physical power. It is by your consciousness of the Spirit of God in you. This is how we get through, and it's going to look different for every single person watching. Every one of us. We have all kinds of personality types. Some very, very quiet and just don't create a lot of conflict. Um, and then you have in, individuals that love to talk. And when you talk, you get, it creates conflict. But, <laughs> but everybody has stuff they're going through. Some are walking through very difficult circumstances. And uh, I, I hope this becomes encouraging. Listen to this verse here. It's not by mental might or physical power, but by my consciousness, spirit, or breath, says the Lord of hosts. This is how you're going to get through by the Spirit of God. We can't get sucked into the system of religion because what churchianity will do or what I would have taught years ago is I would have given you a wonderful list of things you must do. In fact, I remember my first uh, two churches giving people lists of here is how you um, uh, walk through your difficulty. Oh my goodness. Here, here's what it looks like a little bit. Eek. So the system of religion responds to a crisis like this. You did this to yourself, you better repent. As in, you're the cause of your trouble. What'd you do wrong uh, to make this curse come on you? <laughs> oh boy. Or some people have said, look, God's punishing you. Or people say God's punishing a country or a people group or a race, so repent. I've heard, especially in the last number of years, you hear so many ridiculous uh, statements from especially from people who call themselves Christians and say, see, look at this happening. God is punishing this country for their immorality. Well, I say scuba on that. That's baloney, not a chance, because Christ has already taken away the sin of the world. So there isn't anything to punish. So to use that as a strong arm, somebody has bought back into paganism culture and Zeus thinking, not the God of Scripture, not the Christ revealed. Um, so when you start saying, hey, uh, God's punishing you, or look, this is the bad karma coming, uh, you, you got to be careful how you say that. I, I think we need to lose that language altogether. Um, the system of religion will say, you are better than everyone else. God is on our side. Oh, oh my goodness, we are better than everyone else? Look at if, a, if a, a storm hits, like a snowstorm, or even a tornado, like we just had recently, not, not here local, but not too far from here, you know, it didn't target non-Christian homes. It didn't ask, knock, 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 oh, what's your faith type? You know, I want to know if I need to destroy this house or not. That's not what happened. When a flood comes, a flood comes. When a rainstorm comes, a rainstorm comes. So to play on this, you know, God's going to protect us. Like, here's another one. Okay, this is pet peeve, but... If you've ever said this to me, don't worry about it. I'm not judging you thinking, oh, how can you say that? But maybe we can watch our language a little bit better. You know, um, 
Uh, here's uh, the idea of a, uh, a car crash, let's say. Somebody will say, well, I just missed it. I'm so glad the Lord protected me from my trip. You know, those those poor people, the, the 30, 40 cars have crashed, and all, but the Lord protected me. I'm thinking, what about them? What are you saying? Because by saying that, you're implying something else. Like, we've got to be careful with our, our cheeky phrases that do not encourage or lift others up. So, again, system of religion says if you, if you, if you get your faith right, then it'll get better. So, <laughs> this is kind of what I told people. So, here, read your Bible, pray every day, practice these disciplines, and the fruit will bear itself out. That's literally what I told people. Ugh. Or we can spew off a bunch of out of context verses of entitlement. If you do this, God will do that. You know, if you pray, then God will do this. It's the if, if. It's the Harry Potter wand. That's religion, not Christ. Perhaps our circumstances are on the wrong are the wrong thing to focus on. Just maybe. Well, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Perhaps. It should be focusing on our attention on how God sees us and how God feels about us. Some of us don't even know how much God loves us and accepts us. And even though you may have heard this for a number of years, especially if you're part of Hope Fellowship, we've, we've hammered this forever and I will never stop. But sometimes our circumstances can cause us to forget the goodness of God. All right, because now we're consumed by the very thing in front of us. And I get that. The performance-based acceptance mentality associated with religious practices must be thrown into the fire. All right, where if I do these things, God will bless you. If I learn these Bible verses and attend church and give generously and, and sit on these committees and, and volunteer for this and that, then, then God has to bless me. No. That's performance-based acceptance. That's all you getting credit for your good works, and you've received every bit of it right then and there. So this idea of being accepted by God because you've done something or prayed a special prayer, listen, you're already favored by God. God already highly favors you. But, he, but you don't know what I did. Who cares what you did? Did you know what he did? What he did far surpasses anything you did. We give the, uh, the power of Adam to... Uh, cause blindness far more credit than Christ has power as the last Adam. Like, I'm sorry, which Adam do you worship? I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> Our society doesn't need more values and morals and rules to follow in order to be acceptable to God. So stop telling people that. You know, stop telling people about this is right, this is wrong. Is right and wrong important? Yes. And I'm going to teach my kids that. But I want to teach them the source of right and wrong. It's Christ. Not my list. Really important. Rather needs to hear and see that the very life and good news of Jesus Christ is what they need. Not the rules. They need to experience the life of Christ. To know what it is. Okay? Let his life impact them. Let his kindness lead them to repentance or a change of mind. Not rules or fear or mongering, but love. How many times have we seen uh, when a crisis happens, and then, okay, oh, rabbit trail, but sorry. But I know some churches, and there's nothing wrong with this, oh my goodness, except that when it becomes a ritual and not meaningful, as in, when something happens, sometimes churches have these big prayer gatherings, and I'm all for prayer. But when it becomes the a pattern of, magic if god will do this get enough people praying then he has to do that it's like trying to strong arm god uh we need a hundred people praying oh please share pray for this post and all, like god will bless you if you share this post come on are you kidding it's ridiculous we, we need love let's take a look what the scripture says here romans romans 2 4 from the new american standard bible says or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. What? I thought it was you're a bad, terrible sinner and are going to hell is supposed to be the motivation. Isn't, isn't that what we grew up with? I did. Uh, and when we went doing evangelism, that's, we handed out tracts saying you're separated from God. You're a sinner. 
Well, that's really motivating. Woohoo! Sign me up. You've convinced me. Oh my goodness. Really? That's not the drawing card. This is. God's kindness leads us to repentance. And from the Passion Translation, I love this. This is good. Do the riches of his extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? Haven't you experienced how kind and understanding he has been to you? Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. Do you realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart and lead you to repentance? Oh man, that's beautiful. The Aramaic word for kindness can be translated sweetness. <laughs> and the Aramaic can be translated, do you, uh, do you now know that it is the fulfillment of God to bring you blessings? Th this, is, this is the good news. Uh, take a look at the top here. It says, do you remember God's extravagant goodness towards you? This is the focus I'm talking about. Because we can take a look at the focus of all the, the terrible things going on in our lives. The broken relationships, the, um, uh, the crisis, the financial crisis, the, the living crisis, the, the relational crisis we're in. Yes, the, they're real. But here, we're being reminded to look at the incredible, extraordinary riches of Christ. Because when we do that, it will begin to transform our mind and change our perspective on even our difficulties giving us hope and the source is jesus it's just that big nehemiah uh, 9 16 to 20 i'm not going to get through all this uh oh but our ancestors were proud and stubborn and they paid no attention to your current commands they refused to obey and did not remember the miracles that you had done for them instead they became stubborn and appointed a leader to take them back to their slavery in egypt but you are a god of forgiveness gracious and merciful slow to become angry and rich in unfailing love you did not abandon them even when they made an idol shaped like a calf and said this is your god small g who brought you out of egypt they committed terrible terrible blasphemies now pause you for a minute before i finish this he's nehemiah's talking about the previous generation of people they refused to obey <laughs> they didn't remember and yet now he says but you are a god of forgiveness this is old covenant you're a god of forgiveness this is why john the baptist could preach forgiveness i just it, a lot of that stuff clicked in, the, in this last week and a half that uh because uh, john the baptist came preaching repentance and forgiveness and it really ticked off the leaders because who's he to forgive it's just powerful but here it is again nehemiah so listen the old covenant folks had glimpses of truth all through the scriptures all right it's there mixed in with really bad concepts of who god was but here it is he's gracious and merciful slow to anger uh and then but in your great mercy you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud still led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water from their thirst. For 40 years, you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that that's a lot to cover, all right? That's a lot to uh, to take in that if if Nehemiah is talking about that kind of uh, a powerful generous God, uh who are we to say um that we're not cared for? What if our eyes have forgotten the goodness of God? Maybe that's half our trouble right now that we're thinking our circumstances are so different, but it's our perspective perspective of these circumstances honestly i think i think if we can pause contemplate meditate be still and think of the goodness of god and that his faithfulness never fails and never ends his faithfulness endures forever his faithful love endures forever we, we have some hope we have a lot of hope yeah i'm just looking through my uh, <laughs> I won't be done. We're going we're gonna to come back to this next week. <laughs> ah, 
I, I hope that you find some encouragement in this. I hope that one thing hits you today. God did not abandon you and will not abandon you. And he is your only source. Not someone else. Nobody else is going to fix your problem. Then, on the other side, you may need to go get professional help. You may need to go see a medical doctor to deal with something. You may need to see a psychologist a professional counselor to help navigate through patterns that have become unhealthy in your relationship or in yourself. Go see somebody. Um, these, that's why they're there. Uh, the holistic health is really important. But if, right now, my focus is on your mind. And when your mind is not focused on... Uh, who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, and how Christ wants us to love all around us, um, then that our eyes are then focused inwardly instead, self-centered. And that's not the way to walk. That's where we can become blind and forget that we've already been blessed and given everything we need. <laughs> yeah, we've been given everything we need. I think it's pretty powerful. All right. This week, um, we're going to head to our... Uh, our uh, zoom chat so if you want to join us for that to uh, click or message me on facebook for the link and uh, i'm going to switch over to it in just a few moments um and then don't forget donations for those that uh, are willing to uh, I, I forgot to ask jen if anything came in for uh, uh our benevolent compassion fund but uh, that's still open and available we're going to try and do it through the summer we, we've just we've had very little come in and we have people that could really use some help so um as it comes in we give so that's how it works that's it i hope you guys have a really great day and i look forward to seeing you all next week don't forget um tuesday night if you want to join in for the live fireside talk on forgiveness and then wednesday morning 8 a.m uh for the live conversation on what is hell part six our last one uh i think you'll you'll enjoy that so okay i'm gonna sign off you guys uh we'll catch you on the zoom call in a few minutes see you later